My name is John Cullen, and I want to tell you a story. It's a story about a scandal, broken relationships, gossip, rumors, money, corporate rivalry, and curling. It's the story of Broomgate, how a single broom, yes, a broom, turned friends into foes and almost killed the 500-year-old sport of curling. It was a year I'd like to forget. Broomgate, available now. Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. Over the past few weeks, you may have heard a whole bunch of legal, political, and even constitutional terms thrown around. Almost always by a politician on one side or the other who wants you to agree with them, be scared of the other side, or hopefully both. Federal Conservative leader Pierre Polyev has promised to use the notwithstanding clause to enact criminal justice reforms if he's elected. Federal liberal politicians would like you to know that this means he would use that clause on anything. Meanwhile, conservative MPs, though notably not Polyev, have been making noise about restricting abortion. And liberals would like you to connect the dots between those two things. In fact, they'll lean over and draw the line between those dots for you, if you let them. On one hand, this is a classic case of pre-election fear-mongering and name-calling. Conservatives are saying the liberals are soft on crime, are letting murderers out of jail. Liberals saying conservatives will destroy your freedoms, will restrict a woman's right to choose. But beyond those threats and those accusations, there is a real promise here, one made by a leader that seems likely to become prime minister, to use a powerful clause in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in a way that it has never before been used in this country. And that would set precedents. Precedents that would change our political calculations, change our criminal justice system, and yes, possibly even change our laws around abortion. So today, we're going to try to cut out the noise and learn a bit about what's actually at stake. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Daphne Gilbert is a professor at the University of Ottawa who specializes in criminal and constitutional law. Hello, Daphne. Hello, and thank you for having me. Why don't we even just start with a quick history lesson? Um, How did abortion become legal in Canada? And here I I don't mean, you know, Morgenthaler, because most people know it that way, but Mm -hmm. how does the law around that actually work? So up until 1969, abortion was totally prohibited in Canada. And then in 1969, we had a reform to the Criminal Code of Canada where Section 251 was introduced, and it allowed for abortions under very limited circumstances. You had to get the permission of a therapeutic abortion committee, which had to be located in a hospital, Hmm. and their decision was based on their assessment of the life and health of the pregnant woman with respect to her request for an abortion. And that was the law that was tested in Morgenthaler, So it took almost 20 years before we got that law and before the Supreme Court of Canada. And in Morgenthaler, the Supreme Court of Canada struck down Section 251, which meant it was of of no longer force uh, or, or applicability. And what they said was that it was a violation of Section 7 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms because it was turning a decision over to a committee that should be made by the the pregnant woman. um, That it was it was a decision that was being made without taking into account her wishes or or her life circumstances. Mm -hmm. But in Morgenthaler, the court left open the possibility that a different kind of criminal law could, in fact, be introduced that would withstand constitutional scrutiny. And, And in fact, we're the only country in the world that doesn't have any criminal regulation of abortion. Hmm. And so that that crack in the door that was left open by Morgenthaler has always sort of been out there as as a possibility. There was one attempt after Morgenthaler to recriminalize abortion, and it was defeated by the Senate. And then since then, n- no government has seriously contemplated recriminalizing abortion 
Uh, and so it's just treated now as any medical service. It's a it's considered a medically necessary service and and is regulated by the provinces under their constitutional authority over health. Okay, so I mean, not for the first time, uh, not even for the seventh or eighth time, but liberal politicians federally have spent the past couple of weeks saying that if elected, a conservative government might recriminalize abortion. And we're going to get into why we're discussing this now uh, based on some comments from the leader of the opposition. But first, how exactly would that work if a conservative or any other government uh, actually wanted to attempt this and make it stick? So I think that based on what has happened at the Supreme Court since Morgan Taller, since 1988, it would be extremely unlikely, and I, I would put my reputation out there as saying it would be impossible to completely recriminalize abortion under our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Okay. The language that the court has used to describe people's autonomy over decision-making is is so strong that I think you know, it would be impossible to totally ban abortion like we're seeing happening in the United States. But what we definitely could see are criminal regulations around, for example, gestational limits. That's the most likely thing. If we were seeing recriminalization of abortion, it would be to say that it's, you know, permissible only up to a certain week of, of pregnancy or that it has to be performed by certain kinds of healthcare practitioners or only in hospitals. Mm. You know, those sorts of contours of criminal law that would allow for abortion, but severely restrict access to it. I mentioned that this is not the first time the liberals have claimed uh, the conservatives would do this. It's obviously been an effective tactic for them in the past, but why are we having this discussion again? And uh, particularly, and I guess this takes us uh, into parts of criminal law as well, what has opposition leader Pierre Polyev said about uh, the notwithstanding clause? So, uh, first of all, over the years, any attempt to recriminalize abortion has always been made by the Conservative Party. It's the right. only party that has tried to introduce any possible legislation around abortion. And it, and it happens every year through private member bills and not only a direct attack on abortion, but... For example, a few years ago, we had a, a pretty strong effort to criminalize an attack on a pregnant woman that resulted in the death of her fetus, where the, the death of the fetus would be a separate crime. And of course, that would entail understanding the fetus as having an independent life from the pregnant woman. And mm. so over the years, there have been attempts to recriminalize abortion. But I think what is different about, about what's happening right now is, as you said, it's because of, of the notwithstanding clause that the leader of the opposition, has said he will invoke in criminal justice matters. And so we have never seen a federal government use the, the notwithstanding clause, and we've never seen it used in criminal justice matters before. And that's, I think, what's got people worried in the abortion context. Where and when has the notwithstanding clause been used in the past? You don't have to explain every instance, but um, give us a sense of what's different about any of those instances than what Polyev is proposing here. So the notwithstanding clause, which is Section 33 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, is a unique in the world provision which permits a government to override the Charter of Rights and Freedoms if what's at issue is Section 2 of the Charter, which is the fundamental freedom section, so your right to freedom of expression or freedom of religion, or Sections 7 through 14 of the Charter, which is all of the legal rights that attach to people who are accused of crimes, and then Section 15 of the Charter, which is our equality rights provision. So it doesn't apply to the entire Charter, mm. only certain sections of it. Right. Uh, and it's been used only by a handful of provincial governments, most notably by Quebec, which has invoked it a few times, first to protect primary French language laws. Right. Also, more, more recently, uh, around Bill 21, which was the bill which restricts the wearing of visible religious identification in public sector jobs. Yes. We've seen it in Ontario recently around election spending laws. The Ford government invoked it to shield a law that limits third-party spending in elections. We've seen it used preemptively in Saskatchewan to shield gender identity uh, laws, which require, for example, that teachers tell parents when, when students want to change their gender pronouns. Mm -hmm. So it's been used a few times across Canada by provincial governments, but never by the federal government. 
and what also is different about um, using it in terms of a matter of criminal justice as opposed to some of the bills you just described? So it's it's different in a number of ways. First of all, the ostensible reason why the notwithstanding clause was introduced in the charter during the negotiations around the drafting of the charter was because the provinces feared that they were going to lose power as against the federal government, that a right. constitutional charter of rights that applied across the country to the provinces was going to diminish their authority and, and power. And so it was it was a negotiated compromise. So criminal justice is federal in Canada. And, and so the tensions around provincial responsibility or pr- provincial leverage or provincial loss of autonomy don't apply in criminal justice matters. It is squarely within the federal jurisdiction. Mm. So to use it in criminal justice, for one thing, it, it kind of distorts the original reason it was it was brought in. But also, you know, in my criminal law class, when I'm talking to students who are first year law students and have have never really thought about the law before, I always, you know, urge them to think about the incredible power of criminal law in this country. That you have all of the resources of the state, with all of the expertise of prosecutors and the money that they can spend and the resources that they have to put together a case all being used against an individual mm-hmm. you know who who has only whatever resources they can muster as an individual to challenge the charge and the prosecution and and that is you know one of the reasons why we have a really strong charter of rights and freedoms with respect to legal rights you know that your rights when you're arrested when you're detained when you're charged when you're being tried you know we're very very aware in this country of of the possibility of wrongful convictions. Mm -hmm. We know that there is racism in the justice system. We know that Indigenous and Black uh, men in particular are way overrepresented in our criminal justice system. And so we have problems, uh, and the Charter is one way of trying to combat those problems. It's It's not a perfect tool, but it has resulted in in strong protections for accused persons. And so to invoke a notwithstanding clause and to override charter rights in the criminal justice system is really doubling down on our most vulnerable people. And it, and it is a complete distortion of, of why we have such strong protections in the charter. My name is John Cullen, and I want to tell you a story. It's a story about a scandal, broken relationships, gossip, rumors, money, corporate rivalry, and curling. It's the story of Broomgate, how a single broom, yes, a broom, turned friends into foes and almost killed the 500-year-old sport of curling. It was a year I'd like to forget. Broomgate, available now. Has Polyev, or his MPs for that matter, said anything about where the end would come for use of the notwithstanding clause in this matter and and if it could be used around abortion. Do you, do you see any danger, I guess, here of this at least being a possibility? I certainly see it as, as a possibility. You know, I have combed through what has been publicly said by the Conservative Party and by uh, Pierre Polyev in particular. And, and it's a bit talking on both sides of their mouths, you know, mm. that on the one hand, he has said that the conservative government will not legislate around abortion. He has also said that, you know, he would not introduce new legislation on abortion. But at the same time, he is adamant that he would consider using the charter in criminal justice matters. And he considers that to be something that, you know, he thinks is necessary to clean up some criminal justice issues that he thinks are not going well. Mm -hmm. Where he first spoke about it was in a speech to police and he was talking specifically about sentencing and about bail. And, you know, the case that he has invoked as the paradigmatic reason why we, you know, would need to use the notwithstanding clauses to override a Supreme Court of Canada decision, which prohibits the stacking of parole eligibility. So this was the case of Alexandre Bissonnette in Quebec, who killed six people in a in a mosque. Right. And when he was sentenced, uh, he was sentenced under a new law, which allowed for the stacking of parole eligibility. So in Canada, if you're convicted of first degree murder, you're not eligible for parole for at least 25 years. And he was given a 75 year parole eligibility. 
And the Supreme Court of Canada struck that down and said it's cruel and unusual punishment Mm. to sentence someone to life in prison when, with no hope of ever being released, that hope is an important characteristic of rehabilitation. And, you know, we need to have that possibility that, that a person could be rehabilitated. The fact is that multiple murderers in this country are never released on parole. It's extremely difficult to get parole for first degree murder Mm. and very, very rare in cases where more than one person has been murdered. And I would venture to say it would be highly unlikely that Alexandre Bissonnette would ever be released on parole. But the Supreme Court said, you know, we have to at least hold on to this hope of rehabilitation if that's one of our goals of sentencing. And so Pierre Polyev in the speech to the police indicated that you know, his government would would see to it that that law was, that ruling rather of the Supreme Court was overridden and he would, you know, return to this possibility of having a life in prison mean life without any possibility of parole, without any hope for rehabilitation. Hmm. And so that's the context in which he invoked it. He also talked about using it to overrule some bail reform laws that the liberal government has brought in, laws that weren't directly responsive to a Supreme Court decision, but certainly were shaped by what the Supreme Court has said about the importance of bail and the importance of respecting the fact that a person who's accused of a crime is still presumed innocent until proven guilty and and that we should prefer release and bail unless it can be demonstrated that it's necessary to keep someone behind bars before they've even been convicted. And so those were the two kind of impetuses or reasons that Pierre Polyev said he would use the notwithstanding clause. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, why abortion uh, comes into the picture is because one of his um, party members immediately introduced a petition in the House of Commons that called for regulation of abortion. And Mm. the timing of that was, you know, a bit suspect. And I think once you've said you're going to use the notwithstanding clause in matters of criminal justice, once you've opened that door, I think the would be extremely difficult to argue that you can make principled distinctions and he'll Mm -hmm. be under a lot of pressure from certain members of his caucus who have been very vocal about wanting to see criminal law regulate abortion again. If a conservative government was to use the notwithstanding clause on uh, a criminal justice matter or even abortion, is there any recourse to that? What happens next? Or is it just like, That's it. This is the final card and and it's over. So we have always said that the recourse for the invocation of the notwithstanding clause is the political consequences that will come from using it. And Hmm. and early on, after the charter came into force, you know, that was the understanding was that it would be political suicide for a government to override charter rights. And for a long time, you know, aside from the French language law of protection in Quebec, which was popular for other reasons, you know, not not around the the charter, but, Mm -hmm. you know, that that political accountability, I think, had a lot of weight. It's a new era now. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. In the last few years, we've seen it used much more often, but also threatened to be used. Like now, you know, governments will toss it out there as something that, you know, is, is in their back pocket in a way that is new and a bit unsettling from a charter perspective. And so would there be political accountability for invoking the notwithstanding clause in sentencing? I'm not sure. I think a lot of people don't understand how criminal sentencing works and and bail. And and there's a lot of, you know, fear and misinformation about, Mm -hmm. about that. So there might not be the kind of accountability that we would hope for overriding charter rights. But when it comes to abortion, I think, although I am I am fearful of what a, a government might do if if they felt completely unfettered by the charter, I think there probably would be pretty serious blowback <laughs> on the abortion question. Right. Uh, I think that you know abortion is overwhelmingly approved of in Canada by by people who recognize it as an equality right for women, and I I would be shocked if there wasn't serious repercussions. But you know, in in politics right now, things are so unpredictable that it's hard to say. Let's put aside for a minute whether you or I or anyone listening agrees with uh, what Polyev has threatened to use the notwithstanding clause to achieve. Let's say the majority of voters support him and they elect him. 
Is using that notwithstanding clause and opening up that precedent the only way he could achieve this? Or are there other methods by which um, he could strengthen bail laws and and make sure that multiple murderers don't have that chance for parole? Uh, Absolutely. Parole is also a federal responsibility and and the regulations around the granting of parole and the appointment of of parole boards are within the federal government's jurisdiction. And so he could shape parole in that way. There are changes that can be made to the bail system that would likely pass constitutional scrutiny that would be restrictive of bail. Every government, you know, really shapes criminal law according to their values. The criminal justice system under Stephen Harper looked a lot different than it does under Justin Trudeau. Right. So why go this route then? Why why invoke the notwithstanding clause and all the political uh, firestorm that comes with that if there are other ways of achieving what he's after if he's elected? I think part of it is appealing to a certain part of his base. Right. Who really believe in this, you know, tough on crime, lock people up, throw away the key, that sort of mentality. And, uh, you know, he is facing some Supreme Court cases that would make it hard for him to regress completely on criminal justice matters the way that his base might prefer. I see. I think it's also responding to this idea that the Supreme Court is some kind of an elite institution that is dominated by the liberal left or Mm -hmm. that it's this, you know, ivory tower out of touch with the real people and using the notwithstanding clause as a slam on the courts and a slam on the Supreme Court in particular that responds to that criticism from the right. So, you know, there's hidden messages to what he's uh, saying as well as the overt message. As I mentioned kind of off the top, the liberal government has often uh, used the specter of conservatives recriminalizing abortion uh, during campaigns when they're facing trouble in the polls, et cetera, et cetera. So I know it's useful for them that way, but if they wanted to, in what ways could they protect abortion ahead of uh, what at least now uh, seems to be uh, the prospect of losing an election to the conservatives sometime next year? It's an interesting question because I know uh, last year when the Supreme Court in the United States overturned Roe v. Wade and said that there was no longer a constitutional right to abortion, there was a bit of a flurry here in Canada around the possibility that we would pass a law, an amendment to our constitution, for example, that says there is a constitutional right to abortion for women in Canada and that it can't be curtailed or limited. And uh, I, I remember talking to people at that time and being asked about, you know, my thoughts on on having such a proactive law. And I'm actually not in favor of a particular specific law that protects abortion rights hmm. because I like to think of them as medically necessary services that are treated the same as any other medically necessary service. If right. we don't have you know, constitutional protections to hip replacements or heart surgery in Canada. I don't like to see abortion treated differently. And so putting in a law that specifically protects abortion, the very first thing that would happen is that anti-abortion groups would challenge that law. And we would then be in court discussing abortion rights. Hmm. And I am happiest when no one's talking about abortion rights and it's just (laughs) happening as part of the medical services, you know. That's, to me, where it belongs. So I, I don't think we need a special law. And I think what we need is, is just to continue to have the conversation to normalize abortion as it's not something that anybody wants to have and it's not something that abortion providers you know, want to have to provide, but mm-hmm. it happens that it's necessary and, and we should just treat it as, as, as any other medical service. So last question then, until the next election, what will you be watching for in terms of the notwithstanding clause in criminal justice and abortion? And uh, what would you want to know from Polyev if you knew that, you know, you'd get a straight answer off the record to your question? Well, at one point he said that, you know, his government would be the government of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, and that has always been the sort of purview of of the liberal government. That's been their mantra. It was the liberal government that brought in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Hmm. So I I would like to hear more from him about what he means when he says that he will respect the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and how it is that that would be consistent with using the notwithstanding clause, which, you know, I don't think should be in the Charter. 
but it's there. So let it be a dormant clause that does not get invoked except in the most extreme circumstances. I don't think tinkering with criminal justice is the kind of extreme circumstances that justifies overriding rights. Daphne, thank you so much for this. It's uh, really insightful. I learned a lot. Thank you for having me. Daphne Gilbert from the University of Ottawa. That was The Big Story. For more from us, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. Of course, you can send us your feedback. The way to do that is via email. Hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca is the address. Or you can call 416-935-5935 and leave us a voicemail. The Big Story is in all your podcast players. It arrives at 4 a.m. Eastern Time every morning. And you can also ask your smart speaker to play it by saying, play the Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow. I'm Laura Palmer, host of Island Crime. Season 6, Sweethearts, is the story of three teenage girls who were all murdered in Victoria, Canada, within about 12 months. So she was scared. Something out there scared her. You've just created the playground where predators can really thrive. She was a 16-year-old girl. She was a sweetheart. Listen to Sweethearts at FrequencyPodcastNetwork.com or wherever you get podcasts. Find your frequency.